Hello and good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone that has joined us today for this third installment of our Impact Evaluation Webinar Series. My name is Laya Greeno, and I manage the Evaluation and Program Effectiveness Working Group at Interaction, which is the largest coalition of U.S.-based international NGOs with nearly 200 member organizations. This is the third webinar in a series of impact evaluation webinars that Interaction is developing with financial support from the Rockefeller Foundation and which are meant to accompany a four-part impact evaluation guidance note series. Um, the focus of today's webinar uh, will be the second guidance note in the series, linking monitoring and evaluation to impact evaluation by Bert Perrin. Bert is an independent consultant based in France with more than 35 years of experience assisting governments, international organizations, and NGOs with a variety of quality assurance, evaluation, and strategic planning services. Um, last year, he was made an honorary lifetime member of the European Evaluation Society um, in recognition of his exceptional contributions to the Society and to Evaluation. And previous to that, he was also vice president of the International Organization for for Cooperation and Evaluation, IOCE. So I'm very much looking forward to Bert's presentation this morning, and I'm sure you are as well. So I um, will begin our session today with just a short overview of this series, and then we'll be turning it over to Bert for his presentation on the guidance note. Uh, we'll then have about 20 minutes for questions and answers, and then I'll conclude with some next steps. So the purpose of this four-part guidance note series is to increase organizations' understanding of and ability to conduct high-quality impact evaluation. The four notes in the series are Introduction to Impact Evaluation by Patricia Rogers, Professor in Public Sector Evaluation at RMIT University, Linking Monitoring and Evaluation to Impact Evaluation by Bert Perrin, which is what you'll be hearing more about today, Introduction to Mixed Methods and Impact Evaluation by Michael Bamberger, and Use of Impact Evaluation Results by David Bonbright, Chief Executive of Keystone Accountability. This series is targeted at NGO staff in particular um, and is therefore being developed with extensive input from interaction members, but the notes will be useful to staff in a variety of organizations such as those joining us today. Uh, the notes are just 20 to 30 pages in length, so they're just meant to serve as an introduction to these topics to raise the issues that senior managers, evaluation specialists, and others involved in impact evaluation should be thinking about, to provide them with some practical guidance, and also point people to some additional resources. Our hope, basically, is that they'll help people make more informed decisions around impact evaluation. Um, I'd also like to mention, um, since I know people from overseas are joining us today, that the notes will be translated into Spanish, French, and Arabic. The notes, along with the recordings and presentations from the webinars, will be posted on Interaction's website as they're developed at the link you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, as you can see, the first two, uh, the first guidance notes and materials from the first two webinars um, associated with that note. The first uh, was a, an overview of the note by Patricia Rogers, and the other with two interaction members, Oxfam America and Save the Children, have already been posted um, on the website. And for those who submitted questions um, to for that webinar, the, the responses to those questions have also been posted on the website, along with some additional resources that Patricia threw in. <laughs> So just a couple of notes on the technology before we begin. Um, if you would like to minimize or maximize this webinar screen, uh, just click on the orange arrow. You can view the presentation in full screen mode by clicking on the blue box uh, below that. Um, due to the large number of people joining us today, we will not be using the raise your hand feature and you will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. But if you have a question, please type it into the question box here. Um, I'll be monitoring questions throughout Bert's presentation, so please feel free to send me questions as you think of them. Um, and with that, Bert, I am going to turn it over to you.
Hello. Um, good morning to those of you in the Americas. Um, good afternoon to those of you in Africa and Europe. And good evening to those of you in Asia. If there's anyone from Australasia, it's the middle of the night, and you're either an insomniac or completely obsessed about evaluation. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to um, Hopefully you have my screen now. We do. So I'm happy to be with you today. And um, there's um, basically two objectives, what I hope that you would get out of this presentation. First is to get some understanding of some of the potential linkages between m and &E, between monitoring and evaluation, and impact evaluation. And secondly, provide some ideas about how to go about doing this. Now, as Leia has indicated, the primary focus of these guidance notes is on NGOs and NGOs working in international development. Nevertheless, you know, I would think that I know there's many people here who are not from NGOs, people from, for example, governments and foundations who may be working with NGOs. So you might find you know, it's relevant for those you work with. Um, for others, if there's some questions you have about some of the differences between NGOs in your own context, please do not hesitate to ask. And as Laya said, I think your questions and comments are very important. You know, please don't feel, please don't hesitate to challenge me in the whole area of impact evaluation in particular, as well as monitoring and evaluation. As many of us know, there's many different viewpoints and not necessarily 100% agreements. So I think in terminology is often used differently. So again, please don't hesitate to ask questions or, or to challenge anything. Why link m and &E to impact evaluation? These are often viewed as rather discrete activities where m and &E, particularly routine monitoring, is focusing primarily on description on what's taking place and outputs maybe some immediate outcomes. Impact evaluation in contrast, is tending, tends to deal with more significant longer-term changes, um, focus on attribution or cause, and I'll come back to that in a little while. Impact evaluation often is often treated as something which is a special standalone research study is rigorous, which is quite separate and beyond what an NGO is doing in general, its regular activities and its routine m and you know, so, why link these? I will argue that, or try to argue that m and &E is essential to meaningful impact evaluation in a number of ways. The value, however, is not automatic, and I'll talk about how, how this can be. Um, first, um, I don't know how many of you took part in the webinar series, which, the webinar which Patricia Rogers presented uh, last month which is the first guidance note in the series dealing more specifically with what is impact evaluation. So I'm not going to belabor this. Um, but basically, and this, for those of you who are familiar with the OEC DAC Development Assistance Committee definition, follows this. Impact evaluation is looking at the effects which results from an intervention, not just what takes place, but identifying attribution in some way. Now, these effects can be intended or unintended. They may or may not be the stated objectives of the program. They could be primary, secondary, direct, or indirect. The impact evaluation also involves a systematic approach dealing with empirical evidence. So it's much more than just opinion or, or viewpoints. And also, impacts are generally regarded to occur later than and you know, resulting from outputs and intermediate outcomes. And this has a number of implications for how you go about doing this. Um, it's also helpful just briefly to consider what monitoring and evaluation can and can't do. I mean, in international development community in particular, M&E is often used, M&E as referring to one thing, but in fact monitoring and evaluation are quite different. Monitoring itself tends to track progress against pre-identified objectives, indicators, targets, some um, assumptions, and the like. So it doesn't question these. Monitoring 
can take place on an ongoing basis or a periodic basis, usually done internally by in-house staff, using existing data or data which is easily obtainable, not very um, um, sophisticated research techniques. It's usually, it doesn't have to be, and we'll come back to this later too, but it's usually quantitative in nature. And most often monitoring is done for the purposes of reporting and for management. And in terms of being able to keep track of what a program or project is supposed to be doing, if it's on track or not, it's invaluable and important information. But there are limitations to what monitoring can do. And these are some things where evaluation can help in. Monitoring, for example, assumes it cannot question the appropriateness of what is being done, the program itself, activities, objectives, or indicators. It can only look at what's intended. It can't really consider unintended effects, which can be very significant, sometimes even more important than what was initially set out to do. It can't usually address some of the why questions, and significantly when we get into the subject of impact evaluation, it can't get at causality of why something has taken place. Now these are some things which evaluation can do. Looking more, there's, it's helpful to consider impact evaluation as just one form of evaluation. And there's many other forms of evaluation. What are shown here is just examples, really, of other forms in which evaluation can take, looking at needs, for example, evaluation of process, of implementation, you know, of what is what is really going on, um, what is actually, who's actually being served by a program, you know, are these addressing the needs which were intended to be addressed, um, you know, sometimes it could be some perverse effects too as well, if there's too much attention to stated objectives to where programs focus on that and perhaps don't meet some of the real needs. So evaluation, looking at process or implementation can often get at some of, the, some of these things. Now, to some extent, monitoring can tell you what's taking place, but evaluation looking at implementation might determine who it is you're serving. It is the intended target audience, the intended beneficiaries if it's a program serving individuals. Um, if there's differences from this, why is that? Why is this not? Um, there's a bunch of other th focuses which of other forms of evaluation could take. I won't get into this, but just at the bottom of the screen, there's a number of other evaluation questions that would be very important. Those of you who are familiar with the OECD DAC criteria for evaluation would know these. You know, to what extent is what is being done relevant? You know, how efficient is it being done? Alternatives. I mean, there's often a tendency in impact evaluation to look at the intervention versus nothing, but this is rarely the only option. There could be many other ways in which a given need can be addressed. So it could be helpful to look at alternatives. Sustainability is about would the benefits continue after the end of the particular inter intervention. Unintended, unexpected effects have already mentioned. Context, other factors which interact to contribute to the impact, something I'll come back to a bit later. Now, I would like to argue that, you know, another thing which is implicit here is that, or maybe it isn't, but I should, should make it explicit, is that what evaluation can do is often provide explanation why things have happened, how they've taken place, which is invaluable information in order to know what to do next. Now, I would argue that without at least some attention, some attention considerations such as these, impact evaluation may not be, indeed, it's not likely to be addressing the right questions, and therefore it's not likely to be very meaningful or to provide implications for further action, or these action implications may be at best unclear. Well, what are some of the essential elements of impact evaluation? Impact. This is what many impact evaluations really focus on, get very sophisticated at identifying what changes have happened and measuring these very in great detail with great degree of statistical precision. And that's absolutely essential. However, I did talk about attribution, and that implies looking at what the intervention was and how the intervention led to the impact, how it caused it in one way or another. 
Now what is too often forgotten, and this is where m and &E can really play a major role, is what in fact is the intervention itself. Sometimes there's an assumption to assume that things have taken place exactly as they're described in project documents or in legislation, but how often is this really the case? And for example, if we go back to the 60s or 70s in particular, there are some large-scale impact evaluations in the states where after you know, a number of years and millions of dollars, the conclusion was, well, there was no difference between those who received the program and those who didn't. But then it turned out that the program is actually implemented was not as was described in legislation in Washington. Now, this is not unusual at all. Now, sometimes there are some not good reasons for why things are done differently, but very often there's very good reasons. A program should be responsible, for example, should be responsive to emerging needs, to changes, and if it isn't, it's not necessarily doing a good job. You know, one example which was come up was, for example, uh, an NGO program which was intended to address you know, vulnerable youth and initially started out looking at assuming that these would be youth who were living on their own. But what they found out, in this, at least in this particular area, was that many youth living with adults also had some major needs, and which in some cases were even, you know, they were abused or whatever, which were just as important, so it changed its orientation. This is not unusual at all. And indeed, you know, there could be changes in the context. This could be an emergency. There could be other services provided. And as time changes, needs can change, priorities can change. And if impact evaluation assumes that intervention is exactly as described and is unchangeable, then, then the kind of link here is not going to be very meaningful at all. But there's another aspect of this as well, and that's context. What else is going on? Programs rarely, rarely operate in isolation where it's just your one program, your one intervention which is which is causing impact. There's invariably other things going on. In development there could be many, sometimes dozens of other development agencies, other activities which are also trying to influence this in one way or another. If you're talk, dealing with an employment program, for example, the context, the employment context, the economic context is going to be very relevant to what kinds of impact can or not cannot take place. If you're trying to assist children in learning, the existence of schools is obviously an important thing, but also the children have enough to eat so they can actually learn when they get to schools, and in some cases this becomes really almost a more important aspect of school is the school feeding than actually the curriculum itself. Um, these are just some examples um, which, which is important to, to consider. Um, so the you know, understanding in a context is absolutely critical for proper interpretation and use of impact evaluation. And very often NGOs being typically located close to the ground where things are taking place are often in a not bad, very good place to understand what else may be taking place and to be influencing how the interaction may be work, intervention may be working, and that kind of outcomes and impacts which might be resulting. Well, I mentioned attribution. Um, it's essential to impact evaluation, but as I mentioned already, you know, what is the actual intervention? What else has been going on as well? And Another thing which is really critical to understand and to assess is who did and did not receive services, who did and did not benefit from a program. Sometimes you could have a situation where some people benefit and other people do not or may even be worse off as a result of an intervention. And without understanding this, the results of impact evaluations, which may often talk about mean scores of average scores saying that to, that there's significant difference between an experimental group and a control group and not very meaningful. For those of you who are familiar with realistic or realist evaluation by Paulson and Tilly, this is really the essence there which looks at you know who that they argue that 
most programs work for some people under certain circumstances, but not for others. And understanding these can be very important in knowing really what impact evaluation really means and what to do about it. Also, I mean, so there's an essential role for M&E to really help with this. But the benefits are not automatic. It's only if planned for. And indeed, most I mean, most monitoring in particular is done for purposes other than contributing to impact evaluation. It's done often for reporting to donors or higher up in an organization or for management. And these may not necessarily be addressing the right kind of questions or the kind of questions which are relevant for understanding attribution, understanding impact. So it's important to be explicit about this. And I'll come back to this again. And also, I think another point to bear in mind is there's, and this is something beyond the scope of what I can say now, but there's many different ways, a number of different ways in which attribution can be established other than just the linear cause and effect. We'll talk about contribution in particular in a few moments. So just to, um, and you know, again, added NGOs can really contribute here. So you know, summarize, there's you know, a, you know, three, couple, three key ways in which M&E can contribute to, to impact evaluation. First is understanding, identifying when and under what circumstances it really is even possible to do, undertake impact evaluation and when it's appropriate to, to do so. It isn't always appropriate to do so. I'll come to this in a moment, how logic models or theory of change approaches can really help in understanding this. For example, to do an impact evaluation prematurely before a program has really gotten started is meaningful, but this is a common mistake. Um, and also, M&E could contribute data, essential data, which is a prerequisite in order for impact evaluation to be possible. Um, information about baseline data, I talked about the nature of intervention itself, what else is going on, and the like. And thirdly, assisting, contributing information to aid in being able to interpret and to imply impact evaluation, findings from impact evaluations, such as the quality of implementation, data which can explain why change has taken place. If a program didn't work, for example, is this because there was some a problem with the logic or the theory be underlying the program, in which case you should really change your program or do something different? Or is it it's referred to often as implementation failure? Perhaps it was an issue with management, how it is implemented, or the things going on as well, which may have interfered with this. So what I'd like to do now is, in the remaining time, is talk briefly about some of the steps um, you know, I've identified seven steps here about how one could go about building in impact evaluation into thinking and practices of monitoring and evaluation. And the first step is to articulate the theory of change, often referred to as intervention logic, program logic model, or through other terms. And again, this topic was talked about in the previous webinars Patricia Rogers in the first guidance note talks about this a fair bit. So I, I won't go into too much detail, but what is perhaps not realized is that the theory of change can be a tool to really help in planning impact evaluation, knowing when to do it or not. What it does really is a model, an explanation of how the intervention is expected to work. What is the logic, what are the understandings assumptions beyond it, what are some of the intermediate steps, things which have to take place at the same time. What it can also do is look at the traje trajectory of an intervention, when it's appropriate to expect impact to occur. For example, if you plant an acorn into the ground today, when would you expect to see the results? When would you expect to see this turn into an oak tree? For those of you who know something about um, you know, trees, noted oak trees grow at a much slower rate than, say, um, um, you know, a cedar, you know, or, bir or, you know, a birch tree, for example. Understanding this can help you understand when it's appropriate to look for certain kinds of results, certain kinds of outcomes at different points in time. If you do this too soon, you might conclude that, well, things didn't work. 
Now, maybe this is evident if you talk about trees, but with programs, well, you know, one example, and I, I think this is real, of a program in states where this is a program intended to you know, try to try to prevent teenage pregnancy, was asked by the funder to talk about the impact it's had six months after it got started. Well, this is a bit absurd, but so many programs, you know, by the time you know they're established, they have to hire staff, set up facilities, offices, and make contact with others in the field. I mean, this can take months, it could take a year, even longer. It could take two years sometimes to really get going. And if a program is expected to show impact too soon, this might not be very meaningful. And I could think of one good, bad example. Oops. Um, um, of you know, when one government which was interested in being scientific about this, where they wanted their NGOs to demonstrate how to have impact in the multilateral development goals within a two-year period. Well, many other things are impacting upon this as well as this program. This might not be very meaningful. Now, the theory of change can tell you, as I'm saying, when results can be expected to occur at particular points in time. And very often, the theory of change is developed by uh, an evaluator working alone just based upon documentation. I'll give you an example about why it's important to involve stakeholders in this. Now, this is sort of a generic logic model ranging from, it's often referred to as results, and you've probably all seen various versions of this, starting with inputs, activities, outputs, and there can be a whole range of intermediate outcomes just for ease. I've just only shown two here, but it could be three, five, 10, 23 dozen or whatever, ultimately leading to impact. Now, this is a model, this is a log frame many of you are familiar with, particularly working in development logical framework, which is based pretty much upon this model. Now, what's wrong with this model? Now, if we could be a bit more interactive and go around the room or around the world and ask you to identify some problems, with it, but just take a couple seconds to think about it. What are some of the limitations in this model? And as one famous scientist said, you know, all, all models are wrong, but some may be useful. Well, just um, one thing is that it's linear. It starts from here works through activities linear. Now, life rarely is like that. An activity produces not just one output, but a whole set of different outputs, a whole range of inter intermediate outcomes. Impacts can come through a variety of ways. And inevitably, I talked about context before, other factors which also can, can contribute to the impact in one way or another. Your program is not operating in isolation, and if you pretend it is, the results might not be very meaningful. Um, it doesn't talk about unattended effects. You know, maybe it's producing this impact, but it may be producing something over here, something over here, um, you know, something someplace else. So I think that is, you know, another limitation here. And also there can be alternative causal pathways. Impact could have come maybe not just from your own intervention, but through a variety of other ones. Now this is a model, those of you who attended the last webinar, Ellison Davis from Oxfam presented. This is a theory of change used for a program intended to present, prevent gender-based violence in El Salvador. Now what this illustrates is that here, which I quite like, is that an interactive approach is taken. Stakeholders, as you're putting pieces of paper on the wall, articulating themselves what the program, how it is expected to work. And, and this helps build buy-in to the three years change. It also can help make it more real than what um, someone working alone may think it is, could articulate to help surface some hidden assumptions. Now, sometimes there may be different views of how the program is expected to work. And as Patricia Rogers said in her presentation, you, you may have different theories of change. Now, here's a, a model which came from this program. As you can see, there are some interacting factors here. Outcomes can come through more than one way. Other things can take place as well. Now, here's a very different kind of theory of change model. And this one actually has come from the context of child labor. And 
very often programs designed to articulate to deal with child labor focus specifically on children who are at risk of entering child labor, labor or removing children who are in appropriate work. But there could be other mechanisms as well. The families can play an important role in whether or not children are working to interventions aimed at the family, families or the communities. And the enabling environment also plays a role. Poverty and economic circle, you know, to what extent are businesses inappropriately trying to hire children? Are, you know, there are people who are trying to recruit children or steal them away? To, tra to traffic them, and what kind of legislation is there, what kind of programs, policies are there, to what extent is a police sensitized to these, and often activities at this level can play a greater role in this direct, than activities aimed directly at an individual. All these kind of factors can impact, interact together, and playing a role. Now, I mean, one can think of a model like this in a different kind of context. For example, youth employment, um, last webinar, there was an example from um, from Save the Children, I believe, which was looking at youth, you know, they're looking at trying to get youth into vocational training in Palestine. And what they identified there is the families are off in the barrier there. This program is aimed primarily at the family. Now, again, this model can be very helpful in showing these different ways in which different impact can occur, but it's not very good at identifying the um, intermediate steps to the progressions, which can be very helpful for identifying when it's appropriate to do evaluations. So again, it's useful for some purposes, but it has some limitations as well. Now, identifying priorities for impact evaluations is the second important step, and this can follow from the theory of change. We also want to take into account key questions of various stakeholders. Now start with what do you already know and identify when is it possible, is it meaningful to conduct the impact evaluation? How far does the program have to be progressing before you can expect outcomes, impacts at certain levels where you could then go and look at what's taking place? And also, you know, it's a mistake or one could say it's even unethical to go you can certainly you know, questions about use of resources to adopt complex pro approaches when the simpler approaches might be useful first. And m and &E can play an important role in all of this. Now, another thing m and &E can do is contribute to information needs. Now, this is a list, list I put up with trepidation. In the guidance note itself, there's still more examples of the kind of data which might contribute to impact evaluation, which can come from monitoring and from routine evaluation. Now, I'm a bit try, uh, I'm uncomfortable in providing this because every situation, every program might be a bit different, have some different needs, require different information. So I hate to provide a cookie cutter approach, which every program should do. Although most often you will need baseline data of some form some data about what the program is doing, how it's actually being implemented, who it's being served, what else has been going on, and, and the like. Now the fourth step is, and this is where M&E can play a major role, is before jumping into expensive impact evaluation, start with what you have, what information you already have. Let me just talk very briefly about three techniques. First is contribution analysis. Many of you are familiar with this, and essentially what you do, and this is an approach developed at, from John Maine, who was then at the Canadian Office of the Auditor General, so it's not a very furry kind of approach. It's first develop the results chain, the theory of changes I identified before. Look at what evidence you already have. Look at what are some alternative explanations other than what the intervention has done, which may have contributed to whatever you can say about outcomes or results, and produce a performance story based upon this, and identify gaps in the story. What are some other things which could explain this? And then you go and seek out additional evidence, which could come from more monitoring, it could come from other forms of evaluation, it could identify the need for more rigorous impact evaluation, 
and then revise and strengthen the performance story. Now, reflective discussions, I mentioned before that monitoring often is involved in collecting quantitative data, but it can be qualitative as well. And many NGOs, this could be part of regular meetings or it could be special retreats or sessions set up to really reflect on what's taking place. And this is where NGOs have a real advantage where they're really often close to the ground. They can hear what's going on. And this can be very, very helpful at the very least contributing, identifying hypotheses and maybe some pretty good evidence which you can then maybe check out with some other sources about what's taking place. The third, I don't have the time to get into this in detail, but what are some other possible explanations which are plausible, not the ghost of Elvis, for improving the employment situation of youth in the community? But what else could have taken place? Could have been the employment context? Could have been programs others were doing? Could have been other job incentives? And then identify ways in which you can address these plausible alternative explanations. And sometimes it can be very simple ways, sometimes very complex ways, but if you can articulate these, then you can go about figuring out ways of addressing them and identifying what really happened and the reason for this. Um, then the actual implementation of the impact evaluation may be beyond the scope of routine monitoring and evaluation, but M&E can contribute in many, many ways to this. First, making sure that the right questions are addressed. If the wrong questions are being addressed, no matter how rigorous the methodology, it's not going to be very use, very helpful. And what you make use is a set of existing data, but also plan complementary data, m &E, which might be useful. And also provide explanation about why and how things are taking place. And then last but really not least is you want to use the findings to identify how findings from impact evaluation could be integrated with information from other settings. And it's helpful where an m and &E specialist can animate sessions involving other people to identify what these mean. Um, and then this is identified as a last step that really should take place throughout periodically to review, reflect upon what's taking place. How are things going? You know, what's taking place? How has the program changed? Does this have implications for the impact evaluation? And also, the last point down here is, which is often forgotten, is the impact evaluation might identify things you might want to monitor in the future. And finally, the last point I want to make is that impact evaluation, as well as m and is much too important to be left just to specialists. It's the program staff who are the ones who are going to be having to collect the data, and you want to engage them so it's meaningful to them, and also so they take it seriously so the data is really likely to be accurate. So just to conclude, I've tried to identify the potential contribution of m and to impact evaluation to help establish priorities, give you information about the actual intervention itself, what's really going on, which may not be how it's described, other things taking place, helping contribute to this. I've identified very briefly some steps you can take, but you know, and then NGOs can add value, but this value is not automatic. So at this point, I'd like to stop. I've taken run over my time by a couple of minutes, and would welcome your questions and hope we have some lively discussion and debate. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bert. Um, I'll switch it over back to me. So just a reminder um, that if you would like to, um, to ask questions, you can type your question in the question box. Um, we do already have a few questions. And just to start off, um, some, some of these questions are more related about impact evaluation itself. We got a request for clarification um, between the different of the difference between evaluation and impact evaluation. As Bert mentioned, impact evaluation is just one type of evaluation. Um, and then also a question about the, the purpose of, of impact evaluation. Are you, is impact evaluation looking at the changes in people's lives? And also a question about when I, impact evaluation should take place. So Bert, I'll, I'll let you answer those questions to start. 
Okay. Um, briefly, I think you have answered the first question, Laya. Impact evaluation is a form of evaluation, and the particular emphasis of impact evaluation is first on attribution, whereas other forms of evaluation might be looking at needs, might be looking at how the providing descriptive information, who a program is being served, and the like. So impact evaluation is focusing specifically on how changes have taken place, how have they come about, and attribution, causality in one way or another, or contribution. I mean, the other aspect, and this gets into the next question, and I should say that there's more than one definition of impact evaluation floating about. Perhaps the most common definition would come to OECD DAC looks at it. impact is coming at the end of the results chain at really the major changes which come about through, you know, may, which really refers to major changes in people's lives, you know, major reductions in poverty, for example, not just intermediate changes of, you know, changing, you know, of, of taking some, some, some simple steps. Now, some other definitions of impact evaluation might not go quite far along the results chain, but it should be something significant. And I would suggest that you should, should look at some changes in one way or another in people's lives. Now, one impact evaluation must take place. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to take place at all. Perhaps let me rephrase it. One would be most useful to take place. Um, well, first off, only when it's you've allowed sufficient time so that impact can actually have occurred. If you try to evaluate impact before it could take place, you might find that that there isn't any impact to look at, but this isn't very realistic. And I find workers in development and many other MGOs are by very nature, and you would like this, are very positive, optimistic people, perhaps a little over-optimistic about when they think things are going to take place. And this can be a danger of setting up a program for failure if you undertake impact evaluation too soon. The other thing is impact evaluation can be expensive, can be time consuming. You can't do it, you shouldn't do it in all cases. You want to think about impact. So do it when it's going to provide complementary information, when the information can actually be useful and can be actionable. Evaluation has no intrinsic value by itself, but it can be very valuable if it could help in assisting in evaluative thinking and helping people think about outcomes and providing guidance for future directions. Okay. Um, thank you, Bert. Let me get the, the next questions up on the screen. So we have one question um, when you... Um, I think you've, you've t addressed the first question a, a bit um, about when impact evaluation wouldn't be appropriate. But another question, and you can address that in more detail if you'd like, but another question we receive um, is related to the role of, of program staff. This person mentions that in practice, trying to get staff at the community level into the periodical practice of m and &E is quite complicated due to the fact that there is a common impression that one is trying to evaluate their work. So may, perhaps you could talk about what organizations might be able to do to um, encourage their staff to view m and &E more positively and which of course is crucial for getting the good quality data you'll you'll need for an impact evaluation. Okay, thank you for, for this question. I think I've touched upon the first one. The second one, I and mean, this is a question which goes beyond just impact evaluation, and it's an important one. And to you know, I think the simple answer if you want staff or other at the community level to get engaged in m and &E, and other than a routine, you know, passive way, what's in it for them? What can they get out of it? And if you can't give them any, inf any show them why it's of value to them, then of course there's going to be some resistance. It's very often imposed upon people. On the other hand, if you could engage people in discussing what is it they're trying to do, how do they know it's going to work? What information would help them in being able to 
better do serve the people they're trying to serve, better accomplish what they're trying to do, then the chip focus can change a bit from evaluating them to evaluating the, you know, to really provide information which can help them. Now, very often, programs aren't as effective as they are in spite of, rather than because of what program staff do. It could be, for example, because they're not given sufficient resources or to other constraints from other organization. And evaluation can be very helpful to staff in documenting these things. So it's not just staff complaining that they're not getting the support they need, but you could have independent evaluation which can verify this. So if you can identify how it can be helpful, then the more people can gain from it, then they're more likely to get something out of it. Now, another thing which is helpful is to provide some recognition and sentence to some form when people do do this. And one of the most important things which costs almost nothing which can be done, which ironically happens so infrequently, is to provide feedback. I mean, staff, it used to be that, you know, that used to mail on their data and on paper form and they never hear back. Now you send it electronically and you don't know what happens at the other end. Do people throw it in the garbage or just delete the file? What, what happens with it? And to just, at a minimum, get some sort of response saying, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for sending my data and also to show what's done with it. And if you do this and you can demonstrate the value and people can see how it's of value to them and to the organization. So I think I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, great. Um, oops, let me just pose a couple of other questions. The first question um, is, how can you forecast whether or not an impact evaluation may be warranted when you're developing a program in the proposal development stage? Um, another question we, we received is whether you can use the same questions that you've used for m and &E to assess impact. So I'll let you answer those two. Um. The first question, I mean, this is where developing a theory of change model, even in a preliminary form, can be very helpful. What is it you're trying to achieve? And, you know, something which should be part of a program proposal should be, you know, a review of literature in some way or other. What kind of evidence is there already about what it is you're trying to achieve? If it's something which has been done in many other places and you're just trying to replicate something different, then maybe you don't really need impact evaluation. It might not be warranted. And what you want to do is just evaluation which is less and less, as I say, less intrusive and less demanding just to look at how the program is being implemented is being implemented similar to how it's been done elsewhere and to identify some of the differences. If you're trying to do something very innovative, very different, where it's not clear at all whether an impact is going to follow from what you're trying to do, then this may be more worthwhile. Other thing also is what kind of impact you want to look at, what is the lifespan of the project you're developing a proposal for, if it's for a two-year project, an impact you're trying to achieve is going to take a lot longer than that. You wouldn't expect it to appear in two years. It may be premature. What you might want to do is look at other forms of evaluation, develop your theory of change, and see at least some preliminary, some intermediate outcomes. Are you in the right direction or not towards your impact? If you look at preventative programs, for example, um, in you know in, in health education or health promotion, if you're looking at programs to you know decrease lung cancer, and you're looking at smoking, well, you're not going to see much of a change in a couple of years in the impact of lung cancer, but you can identify perhaps some other intermediate indicators or, in, or outcomes which are documented in the research literature, which you can then draw upon. Now, the second question, you send questions for M&E to assess impact. Um, I'm not sure. Um, M&E tends to look at some more immediate questions. Monitoring tends to look at you know, really how you are proceeding in accordance with what you said you're going to do. Um, alternatively, sometimes you can monitor you know, more you know, 
you know, significant um, longer term impacts such as the MDGs, multi multilateral development goals, but the intervention, the linkage is not always very clear in there. I think you need to develop the right kind of question at the right time for the right kind of purpose. And there's some questions which you can't answer through and monitoring if there's some other form of evaluation which you then want to use impact there. So the questions probably will be different at least in part. Thank you, Bert. Um, our next question relates to um, the, the focus of an impact evaluation. So does an impact evaluation always have to be about change at, at the individual level or people's level? What about impact evaluation of, of policy change? We got several questions about um, when you would do impact evaluation of legislative processes, for example. Um, another question we received is noting that um, NGOs often attempt to conduct impact evaluations at the ex post stage. Um, i.e. It's, it's not planned as a prospective evaluation design. In these cases, how can program m and &E be used to contribute to impact evaluation? Okay, thank you for those questions. And let me address the one which I think sort of hidden the first one, which I think is a very good question. You know, how, you know, how do you look at the impact of activities designed to bring our policy legislative changes. And yes, you can do impact evaluation there. Now how far along the results chain do you want to go? I'd say you know further along you can go, the more meaningful it's going to be. Um, for example, if you are advocating for legislation or policy changes to implement for various standards for employment standards, say food standards, you want to know whether these standards have been put in place, have they been incorporated in legislation, have they been incorporated in policy, but then you want to go a couple steps beyond that, that's one step, but have these policies actually been acted upon? Very often there's legislation, there's policies, but there's no resources, no priority to actually acting upon it, so not a lot happens. It might be perfectly good legislation, perfectly great policy, but limited attempt at acting upon it. Or perhaps they are implemented, but they haven't had any inf impact. Your food standards haven't really led to any improvements in food safety, and sometimes there could be perverse effects that there's too much attention to these standards and not to other sorts of things, so that actual health and safety might decrease in some other areas. And this can happen, for example, at some well-intentioned attempts to improve employment safety, where the net result may be some small businesses and workers are forced into, you know, outside, outside the formal economy, into informal economy, where there's no protection whatsoever. So I think you want to look at some of these things. So you want to, you may not want to look at, you know, ultimately go completely to the far end of the results chain and look at you know, people's quality of life in, in all respects, but you want to go a few steps along to the extent you can and look at the right kind of timing so that you're not just looking at outputs of what's taking place, but are these really having the intended effect that are really improving, the, providing for the kind of benefits you're hoping they are and you know, considering again some possible unintended effects which can be very, very common and particularly with things in the policy and legislative area. Now let me go to the second question. Yes, that's a common, NGOs are not the only ones who do this. Um, in fact, um, I've, I work with organizations of all sizes and in many respects I find NGOs are actually a bit better at having some data than some large international organizations which after the fact they want to see what's happened with the project or the policy and they haven't thought about what kind of data they should have what, there's no baseline data, and they wonder how to do this. Um, now, ideally, you want to try to anticipate this, and a good M&E program in an organization often 
even if there aren't plans for evaluation, might want to think about in advance as programs are being planned, what kind of questions might come up later and try to build in to some possible some baseline data. Now this isn't always possible. There is an excellent book um, which is written by Michael Bamberger, Jim Rue, Linda Mowbray on um, um, on um, um, and I'm just Realist lost. evaluation, real world evaluation. Real world evaluation. Thank you, Laya. Mm -hmm. And this deals specifically with how do you do this? How can you reconstruct counterfactuals or retrospectively reconstruct baselines? Now, the more M and E data you have, the more likely you are to be able to use at least some of this data. As we've indicated, very often monitoring data M and E's are done for purposes other than looking at outcomes and impact are done for reporting purposes that it may or may not be relevant, but you never know, some of it might be. And another common problem is that the data looks overall at everyone and doesn't attempt to look at different subgroups. Um, you know, men and women is just one obvious example, but there's many other people in rural areas or urban areas, and very often there's same kind of program which can work well for one group of people may not for others and may even harm them. So the extent you can anticipate this, the better off you are. Um, you're looking retrospectively. There might be some things you can't answer very well, but you do the best you can. And you can then sometimes form some questions. How would we know? Are there some simple ways or at least maybe not know definitively, but at least increase our confidence this is what's really happened. And maybe there's some simple things you can check out in a simple way. And this goes back to the point I raised of trying to eliminate rival plausible hypotheses. Sometimes the simple answers won't give you 100% confidence, but might give you more confidence than you have now. And then, I mean, evaluation is different from research. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's designed to help. And we're always making decisions, taking actions in the absence of perfect information if you could provide a bit more confidence in your adding value. Okay. Bert, I think I will have you answer just one last question, which was actually brought up by a couple of people. Um, and the question is, is there a risk of losing the objectivity of the impact evaluation if m and &E data, which tends to be more internal, is used to interpret impact evaluation results? Another person framed it as, how do you minimize the risk of leading impact evaluation with m and &E practices? So I'll, I'll have that be the last question. Um, I'm not sure I quite understand the the issue or or the problem here, there's one viewpoint that for evaluation to be objective, it needs to be needs to be completely distant from what part of the program is doing. It can't come anywhere near the people who are involved in what's going on. But the danger of that is irrelevance, that you assume things, you assume programs are doing things, people are doing things which may be described in documentation but is not taking place. I don't see m and &E data itself as compromising the objectivity of impact evaluation um, in any way. It's how you use this data. If you're dealing with objective data describing, for example, who is participating in a program, what their benefits they're getting, if you could get some data you can monitor about things you're achieving. In the case of education, for example, you know, are children going to school? What's your attendance like? Do you have evidence um, such as test scores, your grades about what they're learning, what happens to them, how long do they stay in school? This is subjective data. I don't see how this compromises your objectivity. Now, it could be there's some other questions you should be asking which aren't included in m &E data, but you just asked this later. So I don't see this as an issue. I think the overriding consideration you want to ask yourself is what information will be useful? What information will be helpful in identifying how well we're doing, to what extent are we addressing the needs, what else can be done? And that should be your starting point. So I'll leave it at that. Great. 
Great. Thank you, Bert. Um, and we've run out of time for, for questions and actually for the webinar, but I did want to mention that Bert has kindly agreed to answer some additional questions after this session. So if you have a question that didn't get answered during today's webinar, please send me an email at lgrino at interaction.org by this Friday, um, and I'll send those over to Bert and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, the, the response responses um, will be posted on Interaction's website, as was done for the first uh, webinar. Uh, we'd also welcome your comments, of course, as well, so um, you could send comments to, to this email address also. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that our next webinar is on April 26th, um, and for this webinar you'll be hearing, we'll have two Interaction members present on their experience on linking monitoring and evaluation to impact evaluation in practice. And the presenters for that webinar will be John Kurtz, Senior Technical Advisor for Research and Evaluation at Mercy Corps, and Celeste Lemro, Director of Monitoring and Evaluation at AfriCare. You can register um, for that webinar at the link you see below, or also if you go to www.interaction.org slash impact dash evaluation dash notes, you can find the information on how to register on that page as well. And that, of course, is where the, the webinar recordings, the guidance notes, and the slides will all be posted. Um, the final two notes in this series mentioned at the beginning of this webinar are still being developed, so those the webinars associated with those notes likely won't be until this summer, but I'll make sure that everyone who's participated in the webinars to date receives that information. And with that, um, I'd just like to thank everyone again for their participation and hope that many of you can join us on the 26th. Thank you very much.